So let me introduce the speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Alex Brands, and he will talk about uh, promise set on uh, non-Boolean domains. It's all yours, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Jakob. Thank you for organizing this seminar. It's been nice to be able to keep up with the CSP community. Uh, I will say that my dorm Wi-Fi is not super good. So if something bad starts happening, please try to alert me by whatever means you can. Which I realize may be difficult if the Wi-Fi is acting up. So yeah, let me just share my screen now. I'll start the presentation. All right, here we go. So yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, essentially a dichotomy for a fragment of PCSPs of the non boolean domain. This is joint work with Martin, who is here, and Sanda, who may be joining later, uh, also both at Oxford. Okay, so where did this idea start from? Well, we know that two sat is available in polynomial time, and three sat is an NP hard problem. And there have been all sorts of variants and classifications of variants of these problems. And in this particular case, we'd like to know what happens in between two and three sat, and whether there's a nice way to formalize this. And in a work by Austrian Gorsang and Hofstad, uh, they did find one natural way to generalize this into a promise problem, which is to say, which was to say, suppose now you're no longer distinguishing between satisfiable and unsatisfiable formulas, but very highly satisfiable formulas and unsatisfiable formulas. And in particular, the two cases we want to distinguish between are those where there exists a true assignment satisfying at least G literals in every cause, rather than just one as an aside problem. And the formulas that have no satisfaction. And the problem, in a sense, is that there are no formulas in our instances that fall inside these two cases. So the result we achieved is that this problem here, where I should explain the parameters. So 1GK sat means, is there an assignment satisfying at least G literals per clause? or is there no assignment that satisfies even one literal per clause? And they were able to show that this is NP-hard as soon as the fraction of satisfied literals that you're guaranteed is less than a half. And in a sense, this puts the hardness threshold between two sat and three sat right next to, three, to two sat and not near three sat. So now our question is, what's a natural way to extend this problem to a larger domain? And we devised the 1GK set sat problem. So, what does this look like? We have domain size D. So, this can be thought of just the integers 1 to D. And we have literals, which are indicator functions of some set. And in our particular case, we're going to take them to be indicator functions uh, of all elements of the domain except a single element. And there are a bunch of simple reductions that show that this is the most interesting case. This is where the core of the, of the results uh, come in. And now, as before, we construct these K CNF clauses. So we have our literals here, S sub A1, which forbids X1 taking the value A1. S sub A2, uh, sorry, the subscript should be a two. This forbids X2 taking the value A2 and so on. And our formulas are just going to be conjunctions of these clauses. And similarly to before, with the Boolean problem, we want to distinguish the two cases where there's a high, your formula is highly satisfiable, so you can satisfy at least G literals in each clause. But the formula is unsatisfiable, so you can't satisfy even a single literal. And our main result is that uh, this is similar to the Boolean result in flavor that if the guarantee on the number of satisfied literals you can have in a clause is high enough, then the problem is tractable and otherwise it's NP hard. So yes, here, our is S, the domain size is S plus one, which 
which again shows that our literals are indicator functions of sets who forbid only a single domain value. And we can see that if we take S equals one, we recover the Boolean result. So in that case, this fraction here becomes one half. And then what does it mean to have a literal that forbids only one value? Well, it means it forbids either true or false. And you have domain size too. So that's exactly what we can do. Right. So the easier part of our result is to show tractability. And we have this randomized algorithm, which is actually an adaptation from an algorithm for two sets by Papa Dimitri. So what does it do? It, it sort of does the obvious thing. You just choose any arbitrary assignment to your formula. And as long as the formula is not satisfied, you just choose an unsatisfied clause and you flip one of the literals. So yeah, we arbitrarily pick satisfied clause C choose one of its literals. And now there are many values that we could flip XI to to satisfy the literal, but the literal forbids only a single value. And we just randomly choose any of those. It doesn't matter. In the Boolean case, you've only got one choice, but here there are many. And so what is what does the analysis of this algorithm look like? Well, suppose that we have a G satisfying assignment X star so that means an assignment satisfying at least G liberals in every clause. And then let XT be the assignment obtained at iteration T of the algorithm after repeating while loop for T steps. And now we claim that as T increases, the distance from XT to X star in expectation decreases. And this follows from a simple calculation uh, which depends on this inequality here. If you reverse the inequality, then this is no longer true. And that's why the algorithm doesn't work in the hard regime. So essentially we have a bias random walk, which reaches our assignment X star with constant probability in order of N squared steps. And you can make this prob probability fairly small and just change the constant here. One thing that's also interesting to note about this algorithm not only does it find a one satisfying assignment for the formula, but it actually finds something much stronger. It finds the G satisfying assignment X star. And this is something which actually appears often in promise CFDs, is that when you want to show tractability, you show it for the, for the search problem, which is at least as hard as the decision problem. And when you want to show hardness, you show it for the decision problem. And it's not known in general, I believe, whether the two are equivalent. Okay, so yeah, that's, that algorithm is like 30 years old now. Are there any more modern ways to show tractability? Well, there are in fact these polymorphisms. So we can look at what polymorphisms we might have in the easy regime. And in the Boolean case in this regime, there were many majority polymorphisms. Now majority doesn't immediately make sense over domain of size more than two, but there's quite an easy generalization uh, let me come back to this point. So plurality functions turn out to be polymorphisms. And what do those do? Essentially, they return the value that appears most frequently in the input. And if there are ties, in this case, we just break ties in a way such that the function becomes symmetric. Here, that all polymorphisms of set flat are conservative. This is quite important to hardness proof. This just means that a polymorphism must return one of the values that it's input. Okay, so which functions do we have? So when G over K is strictly greater than S over S plus one, we have plurality polymorphisms of all arities which means that the BLT linear programming relaxation applies, you can solve it. And when we're right on the threshold where G over K is equal to S over S plus one, we actually don't have symmetric poles of all arities because 
you get some difficulty breaking ties. There's no good way to resolve it. There's another problems that have polymorphisms of infinitely many arities, uh, symmetric polymorphisms of infinitely many arities, and that's the combination of the DLT. In general, the question we want to ask is, how are the polymorphisms limited in the hard regime? And if we look at our class of plurality polymorphisms, which interface nicely with detractability, it turns out that these now have only bounded essential arity, but the problem still has other polymorphisms of unbounded essential arity. We can't use essential arity arguments to derive hardness, as was done in the Boolean case with two plus epsilon stuff. And it turns out we can also show the polymorphisms of this problem don't satisfy other sufficient hardness conditions that were used elsewhere, such as fixing sets or avoiding sets, or even the quite strong condition of epsilon robustness, or uh, sort of special conditions like lack of Olshak polymorphisms. So really all the known sufficient hardness conditions uh, didn't hold for this problem. So we need, need either come up with a new hardness source or a new kind of property of the polymorphism. Okay, so what worked is this notion of smug sets. And a smug set is a set of coordinates of your function whose values are equal to the output value of the function. So the set of i such that vi equals the output f of v. And the reason they're called smug is that I guess they're proud or they're happy that the function has chosen their particular value. Okay, so here is an illustration of what this means. I'll walk you through uh, all the variables in the setup. So here we're in the case with k equals five. So we have five CNF formulas and the columns correspond to assignments uh, that satisfy a clause. In this case, our clause is a disjunction of these literals. So the literal forbidding x1 equal to 3, x2 equal to 2, and so on. And we can see that if our function f returns the, the following values, so on this row, it returns 3, that means that these coordinates are smug sets. This, sorry, this group here is a smug set. And the smug set is exactly the set of coordinates equal to the example ticking a subset of the first two coordinates would not count as a subset. And similarly, in the, in the second row, this, these two unit of these two twos also subset because the output of the function is two. And now we can see maybe that there will be a connection between the smug sets of a function, whether it's polymorphism or problem or not. And in fact, we get the result that a function is a polymorphism if and only if some condition enters the smug sets. This condition is uh, so that we don't have any multi set of smug sets, of k smug sets for f, such that each coordinate is contained in at most k one. Now I'll just sort of illustrate in this diagram what this proposition holds. So you can see the output of the function here, 3, 2, 1, 3, 3. If our clause is the clause on the right-hand side, then it would not be satisfied. It would not even be one satisfied by inputting these values for x1 through x5, because you've set x1 to 3, but now you forbid x1 equals 3 and so on. So you're forbidding all of these. So this is exactly the case where f fails to be a polymorphism. 
And now what remains to check is that these were all legal inputs to the function, which means that these are all uh, G satisfying assignments. And in this case here, let's take, I don't think it's indicated, but let's take G equals two. So we can check that each of these columns uh, satisfies at least two literals in the clause. And I mean, you can check just by checking all possible combinations, or you can realize that the literals that won't be satisfied are the ones contained. So for example, these two here won't be contained in the first assignment, the third column, if it's input to our clause, the first two literals will not be satisfied because they're contained in smug sets, but the last two literals will be. Uh, similarly for this column. So this, so yeah, this is a, this three satisfies the clause, three satisfies the clause, and so on. This column here uh, has four literals satisfied the clause. So you can see that in each column here, we've got at most two smug sets, which means that all these all these columns form three satisfying assignments. And thus, if g equals two, or even if g equals three, these form legal inputs to the polymorphism. But the output is not even one satisfying. I hope that explanation was clear. Please do stop me if you have questions. I think maybe that clarified. All right. So, yes, my sets provide new property polymorphisms to study. And then we also required a new hardness source, which is variant on the classical label cover problem. This is achieved by adding layers of variables. So what does this problem look like? We take layers of variables x0 to xl, all ranging over these tiers one through m. And our constraints are functions from a variable in one layer to a variable in a higher layer. And we say a constraint is satisfied by some assignment of sigma from the variables to M. If the value you assign to variable Y is equal to the value assigned to the variable X after applying the constraint function. And now, Suppose we have a sequence of variables of length L plus one that all have constraints between them. This is something that we're gonna call a chain of variables. The final definition, I believe, we say a chain is weakly satisfied if at least one of the constraints in the chain is satisfied. And this is the hardness condition that we proved for this variant of label cover, which is, is similar to the other label cover statements, cover statements, saying that it's MP hard to distinguish strongly satisfiable instance, instances from those where not even a small fraction of the chains are satisfied in a very weak way. Uh, excuse me, can I interrupt? Yeah. So uh, for a chain, I guess you also want the condition that the composition of phi from x, say, 0 to x2, well, that uh, this phi from x0 to x2 is the composition of phi from x0 to x1 and phi from x1 to x2, right? So these phi's cannot be arbitrary, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so, because otherwise you could have a totally contradictory setup. I mean, that might be easy to detect in terms of complexity, though. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, uh, you are saying that it's not needed to put the assumption here. Okay, I, I need to think about it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I need to think about it too. For a bit. Okay, so a corollary from this hardness result 
Essentially, what this says is that for our problem, the number of disjoint smug sets is left is bounded by a constant, which depends on the parameters k and g. So how should we see this? Okay, let's suppose you have more than the number of smug sets, and we'll derive a contradiction. So we want to build a multi-set containing each of these smug sets up to a minus b times until we've achieved a multi-set of size k. And yeah, let me bring back the earlier proposition. This is the proposition applied with the diagram. So if if t is larger than k over k minus g. This allows us to take multiple copies, just stacks of our disjoint smug sets, and then achieve this property here of having k smug sets of f, and then that contradicts the fact that f is a polymorphism. Now, this property is also not too difficult to see in our case. So what do we mean to say that G is the minor of F? Well, to compute the function G, you take its values and you plug them into the function F according to the minor pi. So here's a, here's a picture. So yeah, pi takes the values from G and puts them in F. It always looks like the direction of application is slightly backwards. So now, why does why do smug sets of G end up being preserved by pi inverse or preimages under pi? Well, let's suppose that the last two coordinates of G form a smug set. So this just means there's some input where on the last two coordinates, the value is equal to the output of the function which in this case is A. So these two values will be A. And here, we're forced to take B and C different, different from A, because the smug set has to contain exactly the set of values equal to the output. OK, and now we take the pre-image of this set under pi, and we achieve this. And now we ask, is this also a smug set? Uh, of this minor identity. So we know that the two functions are equal in the minor identity. And we just need to check one from the coordinates we don't have any of these functions. And that's indeed the case. And in, in principle, it could happen that a property of uh, a set of coordinates has a property that's not preserved under images or pre-images of minors, for example. Smug sets aren't preserved by 
taking the forward image of a minor. So now, suppose that we have a smug set in F consisting of these last three coordinates, which means that there's some assignment B, C, A, 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 that outputs the value A. And now we ask, is the image of this set also a smug set of G? Well, now we run into a problem because when we want to construct a value, a vector of inputs for G, uh, minor identity holds, there's no value that we can put on this coordinate that'll give us this vector here because you have two different values in the original vector mapping to a single one here. And then any such sequence of inputs for G, these will always be the same in F, and then you're not guaranteed to have a smug set in G. And there are other properties of coord sets of coordinates that are satisfied by only pi or only pi inverse. So it can be kind of a game of playing around with them to find out which ones which ones work and which ones you can combine with which hardness condition. Okay, so this is the last step and the most complicated one. I'll only state the result. Which essentially says that in the hard regime, so where g over k is less than s over s plus one, all our polymorphisms have a smug set whose size is bounded by g. And of course, g is a constant for this problem. So what does the proof look like? Well, we construct a small smug set using properties of minimal smug sets and using conservativity and uh, quite a complicated inductive argument. It is quite useful when changing the value of the minimal smug set, you can then enforce the output of the value of the polymorphism because it's forced to take one of the values of its input. So these three uh, properties together complete the hardness proof. And then there are some are still unsolved. All right, so what are some of these problems? Suppose now instead of taking literals that are indicators of a set with size just one less than the domain, so that forbid you forbid a single element. Suppose that you allow arbitrary set samples. So you allow literals from an arbitrary family of sets L and a power set of D. A few of these cases will reduce to set sat. I think if all the sets have the same size, then this reduces to set sat. But now you could take sets that have different sizes. And again, there, there are some trivial cases and reductions. Uh, so here this says if you have an element that's contained in all your literals, then the problem is tractable. Well, that's because you can just assign that one of those elements to all your variables and all the liberals will be satisfied. So this problem is sort of too trivial to be interesting. Okay. And again, we can make a conjecture about what the behavior of such problems should be. So if L is our set family and S max is the size of the largest set in L, and now Suppose that we don't satisfy this condition here. So actually this should say the intersection is empty rather than the intersection is non-empty. So suppose we don't fall in this trivial case, then we conjecture that the problem is tractable if and only if uh, G over K is at least S max over S max plus one. Which is saying essentially that it's only the size, the maximum size of a set in your collection that determines the complexity. And there's a bit of evidence for this conjecture so far. So the randomized algorithm is still work of the threshold. And the reason for that is that it actually performs better if your literals have smaller size, because then there are fewer choices it can make when assigning a, a variable to satisfy the literal. But from the hardness side, it's quite difficult to see what happens because we no longer have 
conservativity and smug sets don't make sense when you don't have conservativity because smug sets correspond to having the same values in the input as the function in the output. Another class of related problems are hypergraph colorings. So in the Boolean case, there was also a result on discrepancy colorings saying that it's NP hard to distinguish a coloring, a two coloring that has best possible discrepancy from one and she has worst possible discrepancy. And what does this mean in precise terms? Well, suppose each hypergraph edge, each hyper edge has two G plus one vertices, and that it has a two color discrepancy one. So that means G vertices of one color and G together the best you can do. So even if you're guaranteed this very strong property, it's still hard to find a two coloring that doesn't leave monochromatic hyper edges. And now we'd like to see what this problem means in our context for a larger domain. So what should the setup be? So the 2G plus one essentially becomes the domain size S plus one times the parameter R plus A. So you can think of this as a bunch of rows or columns of length S plus one, and then a remainder so that the total arity isn't a multiple of S plus one. And now, what are our two cases to distinguish? So again, the strong case is that we have a coloring that's basically as good as possible. So S plus one coloring on this graph with discrepancy at most one. And you can see that'll mean you have R vertices of each color, and then maybe one extra of some color, depending on what A will be. So you, you could you couldn't get a stronger coloring property than this in this problem. And now for the weak property, again we put the weakest possible condition that every S plus one coloring of the graph still creates a monochromatic hyperedge. So this problem we conjecture to be NP hard. And now it's actually very close to a problem that's trackable. So if you get rid of this A here and consider instead an S plus one times R uniform hypergraph, then these two cases can be distinguished in polynomial time. So again, the promise is as strong as possible that we have discrepancy zero, which can now be achieved because the arity is exactly a multiple of the number of colors you have. So these promises are analogous in their strength. And the other side is that, again, you want to avoid a monochromatic hyperedge, so the largest possible edge you can have. So tractability of this problem follows easily from tractability of that. And this conjecture here, we're not too sure how to approach. So this is just the conjecture we, we copied. And in particular, the conjecture would imply all the sets have hardness results. So why is this conjecture difficult and not achievable by exactly the same method as sets at? Well, mainly because, again, the polymorphisms are not conservative, so we can't use smug sets. And there's much more symmetry as well in a coloring problem than in a problem with a clause with literals. Because in a clause with literals, the order sort of matters. You can't just permute the values arbitrarily as you can when you have a coloring. And then that gives a weaker guarantee on how the rows of inputs to polymorphisms interact. So this problem could end up being quite a lot more difficult. But I think it's an interesting generalization to consider. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, are there some questions? Libor? 
So uh, there, there was this, you mentioned that in this more general situation where you have uh, other unary constraints than just yeah, all but one. Uh, let me see. So here, uh, here on this slide. So you say that the uh, a randomized algorithm still works. Does it still have a block symmetric polymorphisms? So you can use the tractability result of, of Venka Tong. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't checked that for the tractability case. Uh -huh. But yes, I understand that that, that would <laughs> be only plus a fine algorithm to be used. Mm, OK. And uh, yeah. like, uh, one more question. So there is this uh, uh, general hypergraph coloring conjecture. Uh, this here. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, didn't see it before. So is, is it in any relationship with uh, the hypergraph, hypergraph coloring result or, or not really? Like that uh, it's, you know, you mean, does it have any relation to known results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if I mean, hardness of this would imply hardness of, say, uh, this result that is hard to find k coloring of two colorable hypergraph or, or such things. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure which other problems hardness it might imply other than set set, mm -hmm. which is obviously already solved now. But I think there are quite a few related problems with similar kinds of colorings, for example, with rainbow colorings, or a mix of rainbow and discrepancy promise colorings as well. Yeah, so it might be really good. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, some more questions? So maybe I'll ask a question about the hypergraph coloring thing. So here, if you make the soundness not S plus one coloring, but two coloring, is that known? I mean, by known results on rainbow coloring or something, so. Uh, you mean in the conjecture here? Yeah, I mean, suppose you promise that there is a S plus one coloring of discrepancy at most one, that in particular yeah. implies yeah. that there is a um, two coloring, um, but then finding like such a, Two coloring might be harder, right? Because you're so so may, it'll make the hardness easier if you replace the second bullet instead of every S plus one coloring as every two coloring. So is I that see, yeah, because it shrinks the gap between the two. Uh, I don't know yeah. if that's known. I haven't thought about it yet, yeah. actually. So this is the yeah. context some of the rainbow coloring results get. So but here you have a slightly stronger promise in the completeness case that the discrepancy is at most one. So mm -hmm. yeah. well, that would be a good thing to look at. Is that um, may I, is that actually so rainbow rainbow coloring is also a like for some cases it's also a coloring of discrepancy at most one right right so if you take r equals one here and a equals one here then it will imply but that yeah, case of rainbow sure. coloring is pretty hard I mean that's not known to be hard at least under like, unless you make some other additional assumptions so, mm -hmm. so this is even more general. Okay. Yeah, so if you take R equals one and A equals one, that includes um, the rainbow coloring thing, it seems. Yeah. Okay, thanks. The strongest. Yeah, I was hopeful that something would come out of this conjecture, given that it's quite similar to the term Boolean case, and that in the Boolean case, the two proofs are quite similar. I think they might turn out to be very different here. And then this conjecture may be a lot more difficult. I'm not entirely sure yet. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, some more questions? No? Okay, so let's uh, thank Alex again. Thank you, everyone.